it's a tense time because it doesn't give buyers a lot of time to think. It doesn't give them a lot of time to feel 100% comfortable as far as what they want to do. What's going on? Welcome back to the Closing with Corey podcast, episode number 12. It has been a crazy week. I have a very important topic to talk about today. I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about from last week's episode and then just kind of how the, the spring market has been going because the spring market is um, insane right now. And there's a term that keeps getting tossed around over and over again. I, I have it. The conversation with the sellers, they talk about it. I'm talking with my buyers, whether they've been in the game for two years, three years, or they're just getting into it. They're starting to ask about it. And that term is final and best. And what that means, what it means for a seller, what it means for a buyer, it's a buyer's worst nightmare and it's a seller's dream in the sense to where the idea of a final and best means that a lot of people love your property and they are all going to submit their final offer, their best offer, and a seller's going to be able to just basically pick it. But let's talk about it a little bit more. You know, five years ago, what was the market like? It was where a buyer called you up, said, hey, I want to see this property. Uh, I can't see it until next Tuesday. No issues whatsoever. We'll, we'll go check it out next Tuesday. We go to a showing. We, we talk a little bit. They love the property, but you know, we need to crunch uh, some numbers. We need to speak to our lender uh, and figure out some stuff. You know, So let's touch base on Friday. Okay, no issues. Friday comes around. You know, We're going to want to submit an offer on Tuesday. Uh, let's start it at this price. Let's say if the list price is six hundred thousand, let's start it at five seventy five because the kitchen's outdated, the bathrooms are a little bit outdated. We got to put some work into it, and let's see what the seller says. Okay, no issues. the The climate of the market is completely different now because what you're seeing happen is a house comes on the market within hours. the The bookings for it and, and the showings for it are totally booked up. So. Trying to get into a, a property once it gets listed is extremely difficult. Then you have an open house on that Saturday and Sunday, sometimes both days, sometimes just one of the other day. So a home is getting listed on Thursday, bookings throughout the entire weekend, a line of people for the open houses over the weekend, and then they're asking for all offers on Monday morning. It's a tense time because it doesn't give buyers a lot of time to think. It doesn't give them a lot of time to feel 100% comfortable as far as what they want to do. And the best thing to do in that scenario is to be as prepared as possible. On the buying side, a couple of things here that, that I had written down is a, a lot of buyers have asked me, what is the best way for us to win a multiple bid scenario? And it's such a tough question to answer because there's so many components that are added into it. So I'm going to be as transparent as I possibly can be. I'm going to be as upfront. I'm going to be as honest as I can possibly be because at the end of the day, I'm trying to provide as much information. I'm trying to provide as much knowledge as possible. So even if you take one thing away from this, you'll be able to hopefully be successful um, in this, this home search and in this process of trying to, to buy a home. The biggest X factor when you're going into a multiple bid scenario is what another buyer, what, what value another buyer sees in this home. So you could, you can put in and you can structure such a strong offer and, and contingencies and prices and all this, all this stuff. But what you can predict is that another buyer who has been looking for two or three years who have lost 25 multiple bids. And at this point they're like, you know what? Anything and everything that we could do to win this property, we're going to do. Um, I'm, at, I'm, I'm offering 100000 over. I'm weaving absolutely everything. You can't predict what it's going to be. All you can do is structure an offer that you are 100% comfortable with and that you feel confident in and then just being able to submit it. No one likes to come in second place, third place, fifth place, 20th place, but um, at the same same sense, you know, at what cost are you willing to go to become in first place and actually get that property? The last thing you want to do is is win it and then go into it and say, I can't afford it. Or, you know, this actually maybe is is not exactly what I was looking for and have that buyer remorse. Let's be honest. On a selling side, what's the what's the most important things to a seller in a multiple bid? I would be lying to you 100% if the first thing is not net proceeds. How much money are they offering? How much money am I receiving from my house after we pay for all the fees, after everything gets uh, deducted, after after commissions? How much money am I making as a seller? Number two is 
what type of security is this buyer giving me? And that comes into play as far as, you know, pre-approvals and, and proof of funds and down payments and all these things that factor in to the actual mortgage end or if it's cash. And, and how do I know that I am guaranteed whatever this person is offering me? So that that's a huge, huge factor in when we go into it. And then some other things as far as, hey, you know, what's the attorney information? Do they have that all figured out or are they going to have to go through a process? Um, are they going to be able to accommodate a closing date that we're going to want to use? So there's there's so many factors that go into it. The, the, the first thing, though, is always going to be that price point. And I try to make it to where, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, not every single seller, let's say, is is greedy because it's like, you know, how much money can I possibly get? But at the end of the day, if you're looking through 10, 15, 20 offers, it's going to make sense to when you're, you're putting everything side by side and in comparison, one of those columns that you're going to be comparing is going to be how much money am I going to get from this this sale? Um, so that's something to always think about. Um, that's going to go into the the idea of where buyers need to stop looking at the list price of a home. Obviously, the list price is going to be able to understand if it's going to be within your budget and it's, it's going to be within your search. But more importantly, the list price, it's going to be what is the market value of your home? When I go be with a seller, I'm basically telling them, hey, here are what comparable homes have sold within a, a certain distance around your home. And I think that the value of your home is going to be between X and Y. So let's say the value is between you know, 475 and 525. If we want to be at, um, at market value, I think a, a strategic listing price would be 499. And I'm sure a lot of people have obviously seen these, these tactics. That now does not mean that, hey, four ninety nine is is what the the value of the home is because clearly it can go up to five twenty five, maybe five thirty, maybe maybe five thirty five. So more so than anything, if you're working with an agent already, it, it's important to figure out what the market value of the home is. So you're not saying, man, you know, this I'm paying thirty thousand dollars over asking, I'm paying this. It's more so of like, are you paying towards the actual market value of the home? Obviously, later down the road, you're going to be able to get an appraisal to actually figure out if that value is there. So just something to kind of take into consideration once you're going into these multiple bids and stuff. Two contingencies. And I mean, I probably talk to every single one of my buyers at this point about this. And I speak to every single one of my sellers about this. Two contingencies in a transaction that are always talked about um, are, are now almost just part of what a multiple bid scenario is going to be. And, you know, listing agents, I've seen them put in, in the notes as far as, if there's any any changes on appraisals or any changes on inspections, you know, let us know. So those two contingencies are probably the most talked about and, and, and are the most, I guess, modified when it comes into these multiple bids to, to try and get a buyer's offer accepted. And I'm going to break those two, two down really quick just because buyers kind of need to understand this and know this going into multiple bids um, just so their expectations are very realistic because... I can completely sympathize and understand with the idea as far as a person's budget is a person's budget. Totally understandable. We are our, our goal is to always construct as strong of an offer that we can within the, the depths of what we're kind of bound to. So we don't want to go outside of what we can do because then we're going to be in an uncomfortable territory. God forbid this offer gets accepted. You're not going to be 100% comfortable. So that's the last thing we want to do. We want to construct an offer that's going to be best for you in, in the current time and obviously the, the long term as well too. All right, guys, let's take a quick break to talk to you about Simplicity Title. You may not know this, but when you're buying a home, there is a lot of work that goes into getting to your closing, including title insurance. Title insurance is financial protection due to property defects for mortgage lenders and home buyers. But let's keep it simple. For over 15 years, Simplicity Title has been protecting buyers with their expert teams working on all documents that get you through a closing and a fraud protection process that keeps your money safe. You can check out Simplicity Title's profiles on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and go to learn.simplicitytitle.com to find out more about them. If you want to talk to someone, call 877-848-5320 or send an email to info at simplicitytitle.com and tell them that Corey Fandel sent you. Simplicity Title, your title made simple. We'll talk about the appraisal one first. And, and obviously, speak with your lender about this. I'm going to just go based off of like my knowledge on what it is. Two contingencies in a contract are going to allow a buyer uh, to, to take some time to make sure that these two things are met. On the appraisal end and more so on the mortgage contingency end, 
you're going to have to make sure that whatever the contract price is, if you have a, a mortgage, you're going to have a cost for an appraiser to go out to that property. And that one person is going to then give the mortgage lender an idea of what they think the value is. They're doing that to make sure that they're secure on being able to finance whatever the mortgage amount is that the buyer is asking to borrow. So the most important thing is, is that if that home under appraises now, there's going to be a discrepancy in, in as far as what the bank is going to be willing to loan and what we just agreed upon in the contract. Now, let's rewind back to five years ago. It was a different process in the sense to where three things could happen in that sense. Number one, let's say a contract is at 600000 The appraisal comes back at five fifty. We go into negotiations to say, okay, well, now the seller can reduce that contract price down to the 550, which was the appraised value. Number two, a buyer can make up that difference of 50,000, depending on, you know, bringing extra to the closing table. And then number three, you know, let's, let's kind of negotiate a middle point on what's going to work best for the buyer and the seller and then figure something out. It's a little bit of a different market these days to where a seller wants to make sure that regardless of what their home appraises at, and especially when some of these buyers are coming in with what I like to call Hail Mary offers in the sense that it's like, let's just throw out whatever we possibly can to get this offer accepted. And then we'll kind of backpedal and, and, and kind of lean on the appraisal to kind of get us out of this and negotiate down a little bit. So a, a way a seller is protected in that is that a buyer is now saying, okay, the offer is 600,000 regardless of what this appraisal comes back in, we are guaranteeing that. And the ways to do that is you're going to have to show proof of funds. Um, or if you're speaking with your lender, there's going to be a, a possibility to see if your property actually qualifies for an, an actual appraisal waiver. And there's a bunch of factors that go into that. Again, speak with, to your lender about that. It's going to go into um, the, the, the loan type. It's going to go into down payments. It's going to go into your, your credibility. All of these things factor into it. So there's a lot that kind of goes along with it. But the good thing is, is that there's options. There's options for buyers to be able to showcase a stronger offer in the sense or in the case that the home does under appraise. That's probably one of the most important contingencies because anything can happen in that process. And you want to be able to showcase to a seller, hey, we are committed to this property. We are offering this amount. We have this option in place if, if the home does under appraise and you're guaranteed this amount. So that's going to be very, very important moving forward for any buyers in these multiple bid situations um, to be able to showcase. Number two is the inspection contingency. This one is a tough one because there's a, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Again, Going back five years, inspections come around. There's there's no wording in the contracts or, or that a, an agent puts into the contracts that kind of specify inspections. It, it gets figured out in attorney review. But long story short, a buyer pays for a full home inspection. A couple of things come back. Hey, you know, the, the, a couple of windows aren't functioning properly. Um, hey, you know, the hot water heater is, is leaking a little bit with this. And these items can add up and then we're able to negotiate whether it's a credit or, hey, we're, we're going to ask the seller to fix these prior to closing. At this point, a lot of buyers are either A, saying that they're going to accept the home completely as is. They're going to be doing an inspection for informational purposes only. Um, or they're going to be focusing on main items like, you know, major structural stuff, environmentally unsafe. So if there's things like radon or, or, or different things that are harmful for the environment and safety issues. So like electrical issues, all those types of things. The tough thing is the wording of it. That's going to work best for a buyer to make them feel comfortable. And then also to showcase to the seller, we're not looking to nitpick anything, cosmetic stuff, all, all these things. And the, the, the main thing here, and I even, and I even took this from the actual contract of sale in the first line. And I try to explain this to buyers in line 366 of the, uh, standard contract of sale for New Jersey. It says that a buyer acknowledges that the property is being sold in an as is condition and that this contract is entered into based upon the knowledge of the buyer to the value of the land, whether it's the building or upon the property and not uh, at any representation representation made by the seller's broker or their agent as the character of the quality of the property. I mean, a lot of mumbo jumbo, but basically what it means is that the seller is selling the home as is already. And they also most of the time have a seller's disclosure that is giving you information on the property. 
It is just showcasing, hey, we understand that, we know that, and it is now up to us and our buyer due diligence to do a home inspection. If the home has a septic system, you do a septic inspection, um, you test for radon, you test for wood destroying insects. That is all on the buying side. And it's just going to be a matter of what the buyer is going to be comfortable and how they want to modify that contingency to showcase the best offer. I don't think that this whole idea of final and best is, is going to be going away anytime soon. Um, I think that if anything, over the course of, of the last three years, it became just secondary in the sense of what sellers are expecting. And that's the other thing, thing too, for, for sellers to, to, to take in mind. If you go into listing your home and automatically you're expecting, hey, we're going to get multiple bids, we're going to ask for a final and best, and someone's going to waive the appraisal, someone's going to waive the, the inspections, they're going to do it completely as is, and even if they're, even if the whole attic is infested with mold, we're, we're totally fine because they're going to be you know, taking things as is and, and keep things moving. You'll have to be more realistic because, you know, let's be honest, as crazy as the market is, there's limitations, I think, to what everybody is going to be okay with. And I'm, I'm not saying that this happens in every situation. I would never, ever recommend any of my buyers to say, hey, don't even do an inspection, waive it, let's just do it as is, let's get this deal done. Because uh, I think having that knowledge and that time frame of really getting an idea of what is going on with this property and hiring someone to say, hey, you know, check out the foundation, check out the roof, um, check out the windows, check out all of these big, big ticket items, do a, uh, a, an underground oil tank sweep, you know, do all of these things just to make sure that a buyer is protected. It needs to be done. And if something comes up unbeknownst to the seller, you're going to have to have this in your mind to where, okay, there might need to be some flexibility. Hey, I, I, I haven't been up in the attic in eight years. I didn't even realize that the whole thing is infested with mold. Mold is a big ticket item. I mean, I don't even know where to begin with trying to give quotes on that because I've dealt with that in the past. So there's a lot of things that a seller just needs to be realistic with. If you hire the right person, um, hopefully myself, who is going to be able to give you good guidance on Number one, price strategy. And number two, expectations as, as far as what to expect. Um, that's going to be very, very important as far as leading into these multiple bids because uh, I'm coming off of a case right now to where I, I tell all of my sellers the highest offer is not always necessarily the best offer to go with. There's a lot of circumstances that people are going to try to get that, that top offer, but then their credentials as far as what backs up that offer aren't exactly in line and things are going to start very, very quickly falling apart. Um, and that's a situation that I unfortunately just had. But luckily, we had it set up to where we had backup offers that were in place and we were able to literally transition within four hours of, of a contract failing to being into attorney review with another contract. And it's just a matter of just being prepared on all angles for different things. So final and best, a term that is here to stay. I think for a very long time, I don't think that it's going to be going anywhere anytime soon. I think for buyers, you have to just be realistic at this point. You you have to have that expect expectation going in that you are possibly going up against, whether it's five buyers, whether it's 15 buyers, whether it's 50 buyers, whatever the case is, you're going to be in a situation where not that there's not a negotiation uh, aspect of it, but you're going to be able to know what your comfort zone is, know what your 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 highest threshold is. That's going to be coming in with working with the right lenders to know, hey, what is our top budget? Not only as far as a number, but more so as far as a monthly breakdown on what's going to be, you know, uh, affordable and comfortable for you. And just knowing that there is these other potential competition out there, depending on what pool of buyers you're in. And we talked about that last week uh, in the sense that they're going to be willing to maybe do some of these things. And, and it's totally okay if you're not comfortable in the, in the conversation as far as an appraisal waiver. And I, I would always strongly suggest any buyer to speak with their lender so they have a full understanding of what does it mean to waive, to waive the appraisal? Is there a risk on my end with my, you know, with my loan situation, with my loan breakdown, with the type of loan? You know, what is a, a worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? Talk with your lender to understand exactly what that means before we are comfortable constructing that into an offer. I do that 100% of the time with my buyers and I say, I want you to be able to make sure that your lender explains to you from A to Z as far as what this means. Uh, and number two with the inspections is just knowing that there's people out there that are 
are willing to bypass certain things for an inspection to be able to lock in that contract. Um, just know the competition, know what you're kind of up against. Um, it's almost like a way to just study the competition to know the best way that you need to move forward and just have somebody in there that's going to be able to explain these things throughout the uh, the entire process. Because again, this isn't going to be something that's going to go away in anytime soon. So any questions at all, feel free, reach out, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Um, as always, I appreciate it. I hope you have a good week. I'll talk to you soon.